This series addresses the enigma of why the Jewish people rejected Jesus as the Messiah, despite him fulfilling prophecies and performing evident miracles. We will explore the possible reasons behind this rejection, from misinterpretations to political factors, delving into this intriguing historical and religious topic. Why did the majority of the Jewish people reject Jesus as the Messiah? We will present four key reasons that explain this rejection. The first focuses on a crucial misunderstanding, the confusion between the Old Testament prophecies about the first and second coming of Jesus. Although Jesus fulfilled many messianic prophecies, such as his character described in Isaiah 11, his birthplace in Micah 5, and the details of his suffering and death in Isaiah 53, plus meeting the exact timing of his arrival according to Daniel 9, the Jewish leaders focused on other prophecies that were not realized in his first coming. We will explore these expectations and how their non-fulfillment led to historical rejection. Join us to delve into these complex interactions of faith, expectation, and prophecy. Did you know that a misunderstanding about the prophecies could have changed the course of religious history? In this video, we explore a fascinating and little understood aspect of Christian faith, the mystery of the two comings of the Messiah. The prophets of the Old Testament did not grasp that there would be an interval between the first and second coming of Jesus, which led many to reject him when he did not fulfill all the messianic expectations in his first appearance. This concept, hidden from previous generations, was later revealed by Paul, who described it as a divine mystery that includes the union of the Gentiles with the Jews as co-heirs of Christ's promises. Discover how this mystery of Christ not only redefines the understanding of prophecies but also expands the vision of the divine plan. Join us to uncover how these discoveries affect our interpretation of history and faith. At that time, under severe Roman oppression, the Jewish people longed for a Messiah who would liberate them and establish a terrestrial kingdom where they would be the rulers. These hopes were based on Old Testament prophecies which, according to the understanding at that time, were supposed to be fulfilled in a single coming. However, Jesus did not meet these expectations in his first appearance, leading many to reject him as the Messiah. We will explore some of the specific actions that were expected of Jesus and how his focus on a spiritual mission instead of a terrestrial liberation confused and disappointed many. How did this affect the acceptance of his message and what does it mean for the promised second coming? Discover how these past events shape current expectations and the interpretation of the scriptures. The first thing they expected was that he would restore the kingdom to Israel. You can look at scriptures like Joel chapter 3, verses 1 to 17, which talk about how when the Messiah comes, he will purify the world of evil. You can also look at other prophecies like Psalm chapter 2, verse 6, which talk about the Messiah who will reign and govern with a rod of iron. Other prophecies such as Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, talk about when the Messiah comes he will bring peace to the kingdom so that people will no longer prepare for war. Indeed, even Jesus' own apostles wondered and questioned whether Jesus would fulfill these Old Testament prophecies before ascending to heaven. Look in Acts chapter 1, Shortly after Jesus rose from the dead and before he ascended into heaven, they said, John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then, when the apostles were with Jesus, they continued to ask him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Even the apostles, people who had followed Jesus for some time, understood that one of the things the Messiah would do, according to the prophecies of the Old Testament, was to liberate Israel from Roman oppression and establish an earthly kingdom. But what they did not realize is that Jesus was coming to bring or inaugurate a kingdom, but it was not the type of kingdom they were expecting. Look at what Jesus said, From then on, Jesus began to preach, Repent of your sins and return to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. People in the days of Jesus expected the Messiah to bring a kingdom that involved physical and material blessings, and Jesus was saying, No, no, you are not understanding. The most important kingdom I need to inaugurate is one that includes spiritual blessings. For this reason, Jesus spent much of his earthly ministry teaching about the principles of his kingdom and how you could obtain these spiritual blessings, not so focused on the material and physical blessings of a kingdom. They not only expected the Messiah to restore Israel but also to regenerate Israel's spiritual life. In prophecies like Jeremiah chapter 31, it talks about the new covenant where they would receive new hearts and rule and obey the Lord. Therefore, there should be some central spiritual regeneration to this experience, there was the temple, but here comes Jesus predicting that the temple would be destroyed. For all these reasons, the Jews were saying that this man could not be the Messiah. The second main reason why the Jewish people rejected Jesus as the Messiah, let's be honest, is that they saw him as a blasphemer. In the Jewish faith, there is a prayer called the Shema that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This prayer is the central affirmation of the people of the Jewish faith, so much so that from an early age this was taught to them and they had to recite this prayer at least twice a day in their religious services, because they understood from a young age that God is one, there is no other God besides Yahweh, worship Him alone. And here comes Jesus talking about worshiping Him, serving Him, loving Him, honoring Him, and they were like, no, no, no. This goes against what I was taught when I was young. Could God really come down from heaven and take the form of a man? All this was too much for the Jewish people. Then, Jesus comes and makes claims like this in John 8:58. Jesus replied to them, Truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. Wait, for Jesus to suggest that he existed before Abraham, they knew exactly what he was talking about. He was making a claim that he was God because he existed before Abraham, which implies he had an eternal existence. But not only that, when he said the words I am, they understood that he was claiming divinity for himself because those two words are what is called the divine name in the Jewish faith, Yahweh. When God told Moses, Moses asked who should I say sent me and God said, look, don't worry about that. Just tell them that Yahweh, I am who I am, sent you. So, whenever Jesus used the word Yahweh to refer to himself, they saw it as blasphemous, as we know because in the following verse it says, at that point, they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid from them and left the temple. Look, blasphemy in the Jewish faith was punishable by death by stoning. Later in the book of John, Jesus says, The Father and I are one. They knew exactly what Jesus was saying here because going back to the Shema where it states, The Lord our God is one, and now Jesus is saying, No, the Father and I are one. They saw it as blasphemy and, once again, in the following verse, the people again took stones to kill him. Therefore, the second reason why they rejected Jesus as the Messiah was because they saw him as a blasphemer, plain and simple. The third reason why the Jewish people rejected Jesus as the Messiah, for the most part, was because Jesus was challenging some of their religious teachings and some of their religious traditions. Many of Jesus' teachings, they felt, contradicted much of the Old Testament. You have to remember that these rabbis were transmitting Old Testament laws from generation to generation. So, when Jesus comes in and starts to challenge some of their sacred laws and some of their traditions and practices, this immediately put them on the defensive, as if saying, who is this guy to come and now bring some kind of new law or new teaching to us? Let me give you an example. In Matthew chapter 15, it says that some Pharisees and teachers of the law now came from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They asked him, your disciples break our age-old tradition of ceremonial hand washing before eating. And here is Jesus, once again, bringing up the idea that it's not so much about the dirt on the outside of the hands. Yes, that's important, but what's more important is to make sure your hearts are clean. Therefore, Jesus now challenges them and says, Okay, look, I'm not going to respond to your question, but let me ask you a question. Why do you think it's okay to make a vow and pledge to give a certain amount of money, but when your parents need that money, you disobey the most basic commandment of helping and honoring your parents because you say, Ah, I already committed that money to give to the local religious system of that day. So Jesus is challenging some of their practices and traditions. Jesus is also trying to redefine what it means to work on the Sabbath. He's also saying that you should love your enemies and pray for them, which was totally contrary to the Old Testament idea of purging evil, especially in the context in which they were under Roman oppression. These teachings simply went against the current for them. Now, here's another way in which Jesus was bringing a new teaching to them, and they were like, no. This guy can't be the Messiah. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus heals a paralytic in it. He is observed here, in verse 5, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Immediately, this put the religious leaders on the defensive because they were thinking, Wait a second, how can he forgive sins? Indeed, they say, but some of the teachers of the law sitting there thought in their hearts, What is this man saying? That is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. You have to understand that in their system, the way of atonement for sins was through sacrifice, going through a priest, bringing the appropriate animal to the priest to atone for their sins, and also the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, in Leviticus 16, all this was what was prescribed in the Old Testament as the only way to be forgiven for sins. And now this man appears on the scene and says, yes, you can be forgiven for your sins. Why? Because I said so, because it came from my mouth. They were like, what in the world? Who does he think he is? So, the more Jesus began to teach these things that were contrary to what their religious leaders were teaching, the leaders began to feel threatened and felt the need to control because they didn't want the members of the Jewish faith to start following Jesus. 
Now, as I said, there are many other reasons why Jesus was rejected as the Messiah. But let me give you the fourth and last one we will discuss in this video, and it is simply that their hearts were hardened in relation to the truth. One way to see this is in John chapter 11, where Jesus raises a dead man from the tomb who had been dead for four days, his name was Lazarus. Observe the response of the Jewish people after Jesus raises a man from the dead, something you would think only God could do, but observe how they responded. Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen, but some went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Instead of saying, you know what? I just saw something I've never seen before, something that only God can do. So, you know what, regardless of what I thought before, this man has just proven that he is God incarnate, he is the Messiah, so I'm going to put my faith in him. No, instead, they had this long conversation about how they could stop Jesus, how they could control him, and ultimately, how they could kill him. It is observed here that from that point on, the Jewish leaders began to plot the death of Jesus. The reality of why the Jewish people rejected Jesus as the Messiah was because they did not want to believe, their hearts were hardened in relation to the truth. They even went so far as to claim that Jesus was performing all these miraculous things by the power of Satan. Therefore, for all these reasons, Jesus becomes what Paul says a stumbling stone, a stone upon which the Jews continued to stumble, but elsewhere, the Bible says that this stone which the builders rejected, which is Jesus, the builders were the Jewish people, they rejected it, and now it has become the cornerstone of the Christian faith. Because Paul says in Romans chapters 9 to 11 that because of the fall of the Jewish people, now that opens the door for people like you, people like me, Gentiles who could now be included or grafted into the family of God. Why? All this happened largely because the Jewish people rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah, and now God is raising a generation of Gentiles who will now carry the torch and fulfill his divine plan of being a light to the world. So, what should we do as Gentiles in relation to this? How can we pray for our Jewish friends? Well, I'll leave you with this. In Romans chapter 10, verses 1 to 4, Paul put it this way, Dear brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the people of Israel is that they may be saved. I know they have a zeal for God, but it is a zeal that is not according to knowledge. Whenever I went to Israel, last November, I saw a people there who had zeal, who were hungry, who were thirsty, they were praying day and night at the Western Wall, they were reading their Bibles, their Jewish Bibles of the Old Testament, they were praying, they were worshipping. But as Paul said, they have a zeal for God, but lack true knowledge. Why? They do not understand God's way of making people righteous before Him, rejecting God's way, they cling to their own way of becoming righteous before God, trying to keep the law. For Christ has already fulfilled the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made righteous before God. So, what should our heart stance be in relation to our Jewish friends? We should join Paul in his heartfelt desire for all Israel to be saved. Now, I said earlier that there were two comings of Jesus Christ, and that many of the prophecies about the Messiah were fulfilled in the first coming but all the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah that were not fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus will ultimately be fulfilled in the second coming of Jesus Christ, specifically during the thousand-year millennial reign of Jesus, where he will establish an earthly kingdom and gather all Jews and place a heart in his own people to want to worship and follow him. But that is not the reality in the first coming. These things will see their fulfillment in the second coming of Christ, which has not yet occurred. I would very much like to hear from you. Why did the Jewish people reject Jesus as the Messiah? This complex issue is rich with historical, theological, and cultural layers, and your insights are invaluable to this discussion. What do you think were the reasons behind this monumental rejection? Could there be factors beyond what we've typically considered? Join the conversation in the comments section below and share your thoughts. Your perspective might just open up new avenues of understanding. Tune in, contribute and let's explore this together. See you in the next video, and God bless you.